Hello, everyone. Today is a very special episode of what makes lawyers tick with Pulat Yunusov. Uh, I have Shannon Salter, the chair of BC Civil Resolution uh, Tribunal here with us today. It's a great honor for me to speak with her. Without further ado, um, hello, Shannon. Thank you so Hi, much. For... Thank you very uh, much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to, to speak with you. Uh, I um, wanted to speak with you for a very long time. You know, one of the reasons I started this uh, show uh, about lawyers uh, and for lawyers is because I wanted to uh, speak with people like you and I wanted to share conversations with the world. Uh, Ontario has been watching BC and uh, uh, the, the BC Civil Resolution Tribunal with great interest. I can, I can attest to that. So I'm sure that a lot of lawyers will be, and maybe even judges, who knows? They never say that they watch this, but maybe they will even watch this. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're counting on the Ministry of Attorney General here in Ontario to watch this interview as well. I want to start with, with the past and with a, with a po point of origin, sort of to speak. I want people to get to know you a little bit better. So you went to uh, UBC for your undergrad, correct? I did, and then stuck around because I liked it so much and uh, went to law school there as well. Uh, interesting. So I heard that you grew up on a farm. Is it true? <laughs> That's true. I grew up in Burnaby for uh, most of my younger childhood, and then we moved to Salt Spring Island where my parents had a small hobby farm. So uh, not a very large scale, but enough to get a taste of what it's like to take care of chickens and sheep and goats and other animals. What took you from your upbringing uh, to a political science program at UBC? Why political science? I was always involved or interested anyway in public policy and, and politics and public administration, uh, as well as the law. And so it seemed like a natural place to go and learn, learn more about the world outside of <laughs> Salt Spring Island. And like so many people who graduate with a poli-sci degree, you quickly realize that that's not a very large field. And so I decided to go to law school after that, but really did maintain, I think, a focus and interest in access to justice and public policy matters um, throughout law school and then carried that through into my, my career. And uh, you did an LLM at UFT as well, right? I did, yes. After I practiced for a few years, my husband and I decided to moved to Ontario for a year. We both did master's degrees at uh, law schools there and we had our elder daughter as well. So it was a busy year, but a really fun one. And I've got very fond memories of Toronto. I read an article about you in uh, the Canadian Lawyer Magazine. And uh, in this article, I learned that you have a very special relationship with technology. And of course, when people think of CRT, the Civil Resolution Tribunal, they think that it's fully online or mm -hmm. most of the time fully online and they think technology. So tell, tell us about your relationship with technology. What is it uh, about technology that um, you find uh, special or that applies to your work in a special way? I'm curious personally, because before law school, many years ago, I was in technology. I was a computer programmer. And uh, I'm, I'll be really curious to hear that. Well, that's interesting. I was not a computer programmer. You know, when I was on Salt Spring, we had four TV channels, no satellite, no cable. Um, certainly, it was just the beginning of the internet uh, when I was in high school. So grew up with a very kind of analog existence. and. I've always been um, an adopter of technology, but I haven't really been a super fan. I don't think that there's anything magical about technology in and of itself in terms of improving access to justice, but I am a huge fan of human-centered design. And the reality is that the humans really like technology, or at least they uh, are glued to their phones and they have ready access to the internet in a way that most people don't have ready access to uh, the justice system or large parts of it. And so as a potential tool uh, to be able to increase access to justice, I think the internet is extremely powerful and technology more broadly is extremely powerful. But I think it's important to recognize that it's not an end in and of itself. 
um, that it's the, the goal or should be the goal of the public justice system to build itself around the needs of the public. And part of that, a big part of that is understanding the realities of people's lives. And the reality of a lot of people's lives, especially these days, is that their primary means of communicating with the outside world is through technology, especially now that we're all in our homes and have uh, more limited social contact. So it's um, technology is or can be an outcome of design thinking of human centered design, but technology by itself is not the solution to the access to justice crisis, in my view, anyway. Mm -hmm. Would you agree that many types of technology started in, a, uh, in an opposite way. They started with awkward uh, solutions designed by engineers for engineers and that most people had trouble uh, using. And that's why we have so many consultants and uh, uh, you know, that's why we had help files in every piece of software, right? And then slowly over time, uh, design would uh, improve the technology, right? And uh, perhaps Apple is an example of a company that used a slightly or very different approach. Do you, is this, in your opinion, a fair description of a problem that you just uh, were talking about? That engineers really design technology for themselves and uh, designers should have a bigger say in designing technology, including uh, justice technology? Yeah, I think there's a lot of analogies there that when we're experts in a field, we find it very difficult to understand the perspective of other people who are non-experts. And it's a, a sort of a form of problem blindness is something that Dan Heath writes about a lot. I think engineers are susceptible to that. I think lawyers are as well, and probably doctors and any other uh, professional. But because we're in the business or in the profession of providing services to the public, it's core for us to get out from behind our own expertise and to acknowledge that we may be the experts in the law, software engineers may be experts in IT, but uh, people, people who have to use the technology or use the justice system or use the healthcare system are the experts in their own lives. Um, they know what impediments they have to achieving their goal, uh, whether that's resolving a dispute or using an application. And we, um, have the obligation to uh, prioritize that expertise, I think, through human-centered design. And that, that's difficult, I think, for professionals because um, so much of what we're paid to do and what we're educated to do is to be the experts. And um, in some ways that can become a, a real barrier to the humility and curiosity required to acknowledge that we're not the experts in a, an important area like this and we need to prioritize the, the lived experience of the public. Mm -hmm. So the problem blindness uh, is a kind of an echo chamber, I understand. And uh, it's a very interesting issue. In that respect, to, uh, one of the possible solutions is to include uh, experts from other fields or non-experts in designing systems traditionally thought of as uh, capable of being designed only by experts. For example, uh, tribunals, All right? So, were non-lawyers involved in designing the civil resolution tribunal? Yes, absolutely. And I think that's actually been really core to our success. Um, everything that's public facing, everything that we design for the public, we like to describe as being co-designed with the public and specifically with community legal advocates who represent those who traditionally have had the most barriers to accessing justice. Now, ideally you'd co-design with their clients that is the people who are experiencing the barriers themselves. And we do that as well as much as we can, but oftentimes we have to use their representatives as a proxy um, because they're on the ground. They are assisting hundreds, thousands of people a year who have a particular kind of barrier or challenge. And so they're a really good source of expertise in terms of, of usability, even if they're not lawyers, uh, often, especially if they're not lawyers. So the CRT is really quite a multidisciplinary project. It included mediators, um, legal professionals, IT professionals, business analysts, community legal advocates, stakeholders on the ground, and everyday members of the public as well. Um, and the more that we can stay glued to the public, the more that we can check back through surveys and testing and make sure we're meeting um, their goals and our mandate, uh, the, the stronger we get, I think, and the better we get over time. You know, there are some things about CRT that immediately give away the fact that non-lawyers uh, designed it, perhaps in conjunction with lawyers. And I just want to go over some things that are really unusual to a litigator. 
and I'm, I'm litigator in Ontario. So all I do is Ontario Superior Court, pretty much. Sometimes the Court of Appeal, if I'm lucky. <laughs> uh, let me just go through this list. And these are really curious things from uh, the point of view of a litigator. So number one, CRT staff reviews proposed claims for jurisdiction, right? This, 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 this off the bat, this is just incredible. So basically, um, uh, administrative, administrative staff, not adjudicators, make jurisdiction decisions on proposed claims. Is this correct? Uh, to different degrees. So if you come to us and you have a uh, criminal matter or something that's clearly 100% right. outside our jurisdiction, our mm -hmm. staff will tell you that right at the beginning mm -hmm. um, because it's black and white and there's really no uh, gray area there. If you have a dispute that may or may not be within our jurisdiction where we think it's questionable, it may properly belong with a different tribunal or a court, then what happens is our staff member will flag that for the parties and say, just a warning, the tribunal may determine that this is outside of the jurisdiction of the tribunal. We're going to escalate that to a tribunal member for a decision. Um, so it depends on the degree of, uh, of grayness. <laughs> if it's really black and white, then that's something staff can deal with at the beginning. If it requires any degree of kind of decision making, then that's escalated to a tribunal member. But we actually consider it a bit of a failure if mm -hmm. uh, somebody files an application that's outside our jurisdiction, because our goal is really to give them that information up front through the Solution Explorer, which is our question and answer system that's free to use and um, happens before somebody files a claim. We want you to know right at the beginning, before you spend any time or money, where you need to go to resolve your dispute as a basic piece of information. And it's startling in so many tribunals and courts around the world, how many cases actually get to a decision maker, a judge or a tribunal member, uh, only to be found that they're outside of the jurisdiction of the body. And that's something people should know at, at the beginning. They should be able to figure that out in most cases within the first few minutes if we're doing a good job of giving them that plain language legal information. Right, and speaking of that wizard, right, that, um... The, I, I assume the CRT website offers potential claimants that you say should uh, filter out um, improper claims. And it, it, I think it supports this view of, of CRT as a series of screens, a series of nets that uh, at each stage are trying to um, weed out the case or resolve the case. And there are really quite a few of them. So the first one is, is a pure technology slash human interactive design, that wizard that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And the second one, of course, is counter staff, as we refer to uh, these professionals here in Ontario. And then uh, there are a series of, of steps, um, negotiation, for example, right, where basically CRT refers parties to uh, try to resolve it themselves without intervention, and that's optional. But then there is a mandatory mediation with, with the CRT staff, and correct me if I'm wrong, please. And if that fails, then uh, it goes to adjudication. So I see that as a series of screens, uh, like a funnel, uh, and only a you, you, is it intentional that only a small percentage of claims actually go into adjudication? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a philosophical idea behind that that says that all the best evidence tells us that people um, suffer when they spend too much time, money, energy, and, uh, and, and mental and physical resources on a dispute. We know empirically that's bad for people. The longer they have a civil justice claim, the worse off they are in every possible metrics. Um, and so to the extent that we're able to help people resolve their dispute early, less expensively, without um, them having to spend a lot of time or energy or stress or money, um, that's going to be good for people. And so the philosophy around the CRT is we're not going to make this essentially a judge centric model or a tribunal me member centric model. It's not built around adjudication. Uh, we will assume that with the right support and help, we can help people resolve most of the, the vast majority of their disputes well before that stage. Now, this is the exact opposite of the way that our civil justice systems are built. And by the way, there's no empirical evidence to support the way that we've built these systems. Uh, we know that of every 100 cases that are filed, um, only 2% will end up in, in trial. 
but we have built all of the gateways, all of the steps, all the milestones in that process around the idea of a trial. Uh, most of the things we force litigants to do in the civil justice system are not that useful unless you go to trial. Um, if you were focusing around mediation and settlement, you wouldn't have exhaustive discovery processes that take months and cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, you wouldn't have uh, highly adversarial approaches to um, pleadings and inter interrogatories and, and that sort of thing. So the idea here is that you get the software uh, uh, and the, the, um, the party's own information to do the heavy lifting at the outset, and then you slowly add resources, mediators, tribunal members, staff members, as that becomes necessary. So that what you are resolving as an adjudicator are the highly complex cases that really need that uh, resolution. And for the rest of the cases, you're helping people resolve them and get on with their lives without uh, you know, spending years and years and years tied up in litigation, which is very destructive on a bunch of different levels. Are you essentially saying that the traditional courts also follow this funnel where only a small percentage of cases that were started end up being adjudicated, except the difference between the traditional courts is that the traditional courts enforce that funnel through um, high costs, expensive and complicated processes, uh, extremely high stakes, uh, huge delays, and so on, and the CRT enforces this funnel through deliberate design. Can I, you say that? <laughs> I don't think that the civil justice system intentionally is trying to weed out cases through delay and cost and complexity. I do think though, that that is the effect of what we've created. Uh, nobody sat down, I don't think, and said, well, we're gonna design a system of incentives and disincentives that will lead only 2% of cases to go to trial and a big question mark around the 98% that remains. I don't think that's what happened. I do think what happens, and unfortunately, I think this is how much of our, our justice system was built, is through uh, decisions that are made once and then never re-examined or tested through empirical evidence. And then because of our prioritization of stare decisis and precedent, our preference for the status quo over uh, change, those decisions become entrenched. So to give you examples, you know, if you start pulling on the threads of almost any process that we use in the civil justice system and ask yourself, why do we do it that way? What you're likely to come up with is, well, that's the way it's been done for about 50 years or 100 years, and nobody's ever changed it or tested it or, or modified it. Um, and then when you do pull on it, you find that there's just not a lot of empirical evidence. So the way that we waive fees for low income people, the way that we run our chambers in, in many uh, cases, not supported by empirical evidence, the way that we make people authenticate uh, documentary evidence and so on. So it, it's not the case that I don't think that there was some grand plan to do it this way. It's become a Frankenstein of um, layers and layers of process and delay and complexity and an entropy towards more of that uh, that is not serving the public very well. And so what I'd encourage us to do is to critically re-examine everything that we do. Um, you are right that the CRT is uh, consciously designed to be able to help people resolve their disputes early, but those decisions are made based on the empirical evidence that we have. And, uh, and it's also an, a, a conscious acknowledgement that whether you design them or not, any system consists of incentives and disincentives. And so you also have an opportunity when you design something new to create incentives for people to start talking, create incentives for people to, to settle and, and so on. This is fascinating. I'm sure that uh, a lot of people here in Ontario need, need to listen to this ASAP. I just wanted to continue going through that list. And uh, the second point that really struck me about uh, CRT is that CRT staff serves originating process on defendants. Uh, it's just, whoa. <laughs> so, and, and then also I, I looked at CRT rules, personal service of originating process is not required. This is another role for uh, uh, us litigators here in Ontario because of our uh, conviction. Actually, I think most lawyers are convinced that notice is the foundation of, of justice, right? And uh, I, I looked at CRT's annual report 
uh, from last year. And um, uh, according to that report, 29% of claims were resolved by way of default judgment small in claims. 2020. Small yeah. claims, this is small claims, right? That's right. Okay, so, and small claims, by the way, uh, in CRT are capped at 5K, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, That's so I, uh, this is also, by the way, related to what you said about lack of data. I have no idea about this, these numbers here in Ontario and in Ontario small claims court, just anecdotally, when I, I, I don't go to small claims court very much anymore, but I used to when I was more junior. And uh, I, I remember looking at court lists and they had all of these uh, constant assessment hearings, right? And what they basically are, are hearings to assess damages after a default uh, is noted, right? So. Anecdotally, there are a lot of default judgments in Ontario Small Claims Court as well. I have no idea what the numbers are, but aren't you, are you concerned about uh, this uh, statistic that one, almost one third of claims are resolved by way of default judgment at, in CRT? Uh, the answer is yes, uh, but maybe not for the same reasons that, that, that you're getting at. Um, so it's important to be clear about what that refers to. We get about five or 6,000 small claims every year about 40 to 50% of those are low volume debt claims. So these are what are often referred to as payday loans or uh, lenders who lend small amounts of money with an extremely high default rate. Um, and so uh, that's what that primarily refers to. Now, default rates for debt claims in small claims courts around the world are extremely high, usually upward of 50%. So we're already doing better than that uh, at 29%. Um, and that's actually one of the reasons that we brought in a shift to the CRT serving um, respondents. Since we did that about a year ago now, we found that the default rate has reduced by about 10% because we're able to serve people more accurately. They may take it more seriously when they receive something on our letterhead than mm -hmm. something that the applicant is giving them. Um, but it is also important to note that if we're not able to serve, we will go back to the applicant and say, you know, this, this, uh, mail was returned. Now you need to find a different way to serve. And here are the three ways we're directing you to do that. Okay. So um, it's not the be all and end all, but it has, first of all, really reduced the burden on applicants. Applicants have a hard time serving affecting service. Mm -hmm. It's often expensive and difficult for them. And two, for the respondents, it's more likely that they'll actually receive it. In addition to mailing it uh, to the respondent, we also email it at the same time if we have an email address on file. Um, I think your broader question, though, is a really important one, which is that it is worrying that there's such a high default rate for debt claims around the world. We're a lot lower than pretty much any other small claims court or body that I'm aware of, but I am always looking for ways that we can encourage uh, people to respond because uh, often what happens is that for the, these low-level debt claims, they become a cycle where somebody's trapped in debt um, and it spirals and there may be also employment or housing or other circumstances that um, make that a snowball effect of legal and sometimes mental health and other problems as well. We know that if somebody does come into the process, there's a really good chance we can help them negotiate a payment plan, which may be better for them. There's also the possibility that they can have defenses like limitation period defenses or defenses in terms of the applicable interest rate that might help them. So I think it is an opportunity to, to figure out how can we get more people to respond and not kind of bury their head in the sand because we might be able to assist them and there might be um, more remedies available to them than they think. Is CRT not an adversarial tribunal then? Is CRT actively involved in uh, uh, assisting parties to raise defenses, for example? Uh, or is it a separate part of CRT and there is an ethical wall between adjudicators and staff that assist potentially parties with raising defenses or making proper claims? Yeah, so we go as far as we can to give people legal information. We don't give them legal advice. One of the good things about the solution explorer, explorer that you refer to as a, as a wizard is that it can be a standalone source of legal information. And there is information in there about things like limitation periods, applicable interest rates, um, and, and uh, how it, 
coaching on how to propose a repayment plan, for example, all of that is free and in the front end system. So that's not something staff provide. That said, during the mediation process, the mediators do have the ability to uh, caucus with one party or the other and provide a neutral evaluation. Um, and part of what the facilitator often would try to do in a debt claim where both the parties acknowledge the debt is owed is to help the parties work out a repayment plan. So that's part of the role. It is important that they are remain neutral though. Uh, and, and that is um, core to, to our training for staff and also of course tribunal members as well. But um, we know that just participating in the process and getting the parties to start talking with each other often leads to better outcomes for people than being on the receiving end of a default order. But CRT does not allow lawyers by default. Is that not correct? Under the statute, there's a presumption of self-representation for condominium disputes and small claims disputes. Mm -hmm. um, and incidentally, that's extremely extraordinarily popular among members of the public, a little less popular among some lawyers. For motor vehicle disputes though, uh, a person can have a lawyer as of right. Uh, I think it's worth noting for condominium and small claims disputes that we almost never get individuals asking to have a lawyer. Uh, it's just a wildly um, expensive proposition for given the interest at stake for those kinds of claims. Uh, that said, we do consider that on a case by case basis under the statute. And of course, if you have um, a, a capacity issue, or if you're a minor, you're entitled to have a, a lawyer if you choose. I think it's useful to go through the four categories of claims that uh, CRT has the uh, jurisdiction to consider. So it's MVAs uh, under 50K, uh, all straighter claims, which in Ontario uh, are known as condominium disputes, right? Right. Uh, small claims under 5k, which is, is really interesting cap. I, I want to talk about that. And then all societies and cooperatives claims. And for Ontario lawyers, I think these are nonprofits, right? Yeah, it can be everything from, a, you know, a kid's soccer league to a, a nonprofit, you know, for breast cancer, for example, it can also include housing cooperatives. So it's a very broad array of organizations. And previously, those disputes went to our superior court as well. So I acted on a condominium case a few years ago where the property was worth $64 million. And there was a high risk of, of um, uh, irreparable harm to the entire property. And the actual uh, uh, dispute was about uh, two options, the difference between was worth $1 million. Would a case like that go to CRT in BC? There is no monetary limit for condominium disputes uh, before the CRT in BC. There are certain categories of cases, strata or condominium disputes that still have to go to our superior court. Things that are kind of life or death issues for the condominium, like winding it up, dissolving it, appointing an administrator. But beyond that, you know, we can hear disputes with respect to repairs that may uh, tally in the millions of dollars. There is no monetary limit for condominium disputes. And I think right. in addition to the jurisdiction categories you noted, one big change is that our existing motor vehicle jurisdiction is set to change next May. Uh, the government is moving to a care-based model rather than a tort model here in British Columbia for auto insurance claims. And the CRT will be the dispute resolution uh, mechanism for uh, virtually all motor vehicle uh, personal injury disputes in BC after that. So there are no caps on straight claims. There is a fairly high cap on uh, motor vehicle accident claims. There is no cap on uh, societies and cooperatives claims. But then there is this, I think, arbitrary cap of $5,000 on small claims. Why? I think you'd have to ask the Ministry of Justice here in British Columbia because it's a policy and legislative decision. Uh, what I can tell you is that the overall small claims limit in British Columbia is currently $35,000. So for disputes over $5,000 and up to $35,000, you'd go to our provincial court. Um, that said, the, the total number of disputes, small claims disputes every year is very much concentrated at these lower value claims. Um, so we get about five, to 6,000 disputes every year below $5,000. Mm -hmm. By contrast, there's only about another 
uh, six or seven thousand disputes up to thirty five thousand dollars. So um, although it is um, a relatively low cap, it does capture most of the everyday kind of consumer disputes people have, neighbor disputes, things people buy online or on Craigslist, mm -hmm. uh, low level debt claims and that sort of thing. Uh, and so I think in terms of increasing access to justice, uh, despite the relatively low value, it, it's mm -hmm. it's got a very broad reach when you think about the kinds of low level transactions people have in their daily lives, the things they buy, the things they do, the right. things, the services that they contract for. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, there is a, a well-known convention that uh, the smaller the amount at stake, the more relaxed rules of procedure should be. And uh, the higher the stakes, the more justice, quote unquote, should parties receive in the form of procedural uh, safeguards. And uh, I cannot help um, guessing that uh, in BC, the maximum relaxation of procedural rules is uh, uh, at the CRT. And for that reason, uh, the BC legislature decided to uh, keep CRT out of big money, or not even big money, what, what is 5k, right? Out of uh, relatively higher amounts, or out of claims with relatively higher amounts. And uh, in, in this respect, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, trial procedure or hearing procedure and evidence rules at CRT. Mm -hmm. And just to give the viewers some uh, insight into how relaxed the rules of procedure are at CRT. So, for example, there are no oaths, no affidavits uh, uh, by default. Right? They're not required, right? There is yeah, no I... hearing per se either. Everything is in writing except in uh, extraordinary circumstances. Yeah, so, when we refer to a hearing at the tribunal, we refer to the adjudicative process, the process by which a tribunal member considers the evidence and submissions and writes a decision. Most of the time that hearing is based on the written record and that's also the choice of the parties too. That's overwhelmingly what people prefer. Uh, sometimes though an oral hearing will be necessary depending on the interests at stake, including what you're getting at in terms of proportionality. Um, the greater the interest um, of the case to the, the parties, the, the bigger mm -hmm. the significance on their lives, the more procedural fairness in general they're entitled to um, under administrative law. So when you're dealing with um, you know, a car somebody bought on Craigslist for $500 and get some of those, um, does it make sense to have a, a half day video conference hearing? Probably not in most cases, uh, but mm -hmm. it's very much a case by case uh, decision. Like other administrative tribunals, the strict court rules of evidence don't apply to us, but that's the case for hundreds of tribunals across the country. That's not something specific to the CRT. Mm -hmm. Administrative justice, as you know, is meant to provide a more informal, more relaxed, uh, more proportionate, more specialized approach to dispute resolution for a lot of different claims. And in that regard, we're not really different from any other tribunal. I will say though, as a, as a greater point that uh, one of the, the areas I was thinking about earlier when I said that so much of our civil justice system is not based on empirical evidence is this idea around affidavits and the way that we authenticate evidence. Um, we, and the reason it's important is because it's a huge cost item for somebody who's considering bringing in a, a civil claim to a superior court is all of the cost associated with the evidentiary and procedural rules necessary to bring your case. What is the support for that? Well, if you look deeply, there, there's not a whole lot of it. Um, obviously, we have a, an obligation to maintain the rule of law, to ensure fairness, to make sure people know the case to be met. Um, and we have a fact-finding role as uh, decision makers. But I have not seen any evidence that suggests that if you go down to a notary's office or a lawyer's office and swear an affidavit, um, that that magically will make the authenticity of the documents that you're swearing or the information you're providing um, you know, more likely to be so, more, more likely to be true, more likely to be authentic. Um, administrative tribunals regularly operate on the basis that um, signed information, signed statements are fine, unless the other side uh, disputes them. And so to me, that, that is an approach to evidence that is more consistent with the available information. If you ask most of the litigators, and I'd be curious to hear your experience as well, when in their 
uh, careers as litigators, they've had uh, significant circumstances where parties have tried to introduce fraudulent documents. It's pretty rare. In fact, I've, I've almost never heard a litigator say, oh yeah, there was this case where this document was fraudulent. Most of the time, the dispute about evidence is about what it means, how relevant it is, uh, what we can infer from it. It's not that somebody uh, fraudulently created a bunch of business records, for example. Despite that, we make 100% of evidence be authenticated in our civil justice system when really it might be one in every million documents that's uh, problematic from an authenticity perspective. And so I would just encourage us to think really critically about why it is we put people to uh, that kind of expense and complexity when 99.9% .9 of the time, that's not really the issue. So you're raising a propor proportionality uh, issue, essentially. You're saying that most of the time people don't try to uh, adduce fraudulent documents. So we will uh, play this game and uh, accept these stakes. And uh, in return, we will get this huge benefit of liberating people from or parties from strict procedural requirements of oaths, uh, affirmations, and so on. Well, I just don't think, I think that's a form of magical thinking we have as a lawyer to think that when we put our seal, when we ask somebody if they're telling the truth, that that magically is going to increase the likelihood that they're in fact doing that. It, it rests on the supposition that the, the thing that's stopping somebody from being dishonest is not wanting to be dishonest to us. And I've just never seen any empirical evidence in support of that. Uh, instead, for example, at the CRT, we have statutory penalties. So when, when parties upload their evidence and submissions, they have to acknowledge that there's a statutory penalty of up to $10,000 and six months imprisonment for misleading the tribunal. In our oral hearing context, we do make people uh, swear a promise to tell the truth, mm -hmm. but we don't make people uh, have to notarize every document. We don't require originals of every document. It's only if there's a dispute as to the authenticity of a document that we might have cross-examination on it, that we might follow the best evidence rule. And so I guess what I'm um, imploring us to do is to apply uh, reason, rationality, and empiricism to this task. And we're supposed to be good at that as lawyers, right? Those are supposed to be things that we're we're meant to do is, is be logical about it. If you knew a thing only happened one out of every million times, would you base your justice system around the idea that 100% of the time we need to follow a set of procedures that are extraordinarily onerous to capture something that's uh, rarer than being struck by lightning? Uh, so if we applied that kind of thinking, that kind of rationality and logic across our civil justice system, I think we could really give effect to these foundational values. We would lose nothing of the content of the rule of law and procedural fairness, but we could radically increase access to justice for everyday people. You mentioned the uh, absence of data on the effect of oaths on, uh, on truth-telling. And uh, doesn't it follow then that we can, we're simply making assumptions that people usually uh, tell the truth or that people usually don't forge documents. And even if that assumption is sound, even if it's generally true, isn't it, isn't it so that um, um, bad actors may target CRT as, as, a, as essentially may view this assumption as a vulnerability and uh, take advantage of um, procedural uh, relaxations or procedural uh, rules procedure being relaxed to um, uh, per, uh, you know perpetrate fraud on the tribunal on uh, responding parties and so on so there are no um, admissibility rules right there uh, are admissibility uh, rules there are admissibility. Not okay yeah okay so you still have to, evidence still has to be relevant and reliable right. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, and those are the twin guiding principles for admissibility in any administrative tribunal. So I guess the the point I'm, I'm uh, the question I'm asking you is it's related to this example recently that we had in Ontario. So before COVID nineteen, the law society issued a recommendation against allowing virtual commissioning of affidavits, and uh, in part that recommendation was based on this. Uh, possibility that uh, video streams could be intercepted and altered on the fly. Uh, uh, in part, it was based probably on the knowledge of what 
uh, people call deep fakes, right? So uh, as, as you, you probably were right to distrust technology when you, uh, when you, when you uh, did so. Uh, technology can do good things, but can also do terrible things. But then, of course, after COVID-19, the law society reversed its position because it was cornered. There was no other choice. I mean, it, it, you either uh, have the justice system grind to a halt uh, because you're taking uh, the last stand on, on, on your principle that it's possible that forgery will undermine it, or you're going to ha have the justice system move along. And you know, occasionally you may have in exceptional cases, some forgeries, right? So isn't this the approach of, of CRT as well? And then, uh, but looking at it from the bird's, bird's eye view, isn't this also a vulnerability of any uh, binding uh, dispute resolution mechanism in general, where things are accepted at face value and then the burden is on the opposing party to raise, um, uh, authenticity as an issue. And often, as you said, your uh, parties don't have the money to uh, raise sophisticated issues. Uh, to raise authenticity, uh, of course, the person um, uh, can, can say that they didn't sign something, right? If they have personal knowledge that this is not authentic, for example, someone is presenting them with their signature. But then then all you have is a credibility dispute, which uh, again, you have to resort to traditional um, uh, conventional uh, judicial tools to, to resolve this credibility dispute. Maybe at, at best you will have a, a video hearing, right? And then the judge will have to make a judgment call or, or, or the adjudicator. But at the end of the day, um, the, the, the true uh, reliable way to resolve authenticity disputes like that is to hire experts, to invest a lot of money in analyzing signatures, in, in, in doing forensic science and things like that, right? So isn't this ultimately a vulnerability of all binding dispute resolution mechanisms uh, and, that, uh, and that we need to look for a solution on, on, on a different level, perhaps... I I, I, I'm sorry for monopolizing. No, uh, no, I I, 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 I really want to hear from you about this. I'll yeah, stop. no, it, it is a really interesting question, and I think it it gets to a philosophical, um, a, a foundational philosophical uh, it, it, principle. And in my view, the starting principle has to be that the justice system is the most accessible for the most number of people, no matter what their circumstances. And we have to also acknowledge that every time we add a step, add a cost, add a delay, multiplied by thousands uh, in everyday disputes, thousands of documents, thousands of steps, thousands of, of, uh, of hours of work, every time we do that, we push the part, we separate the party from access to justice. Mm -hmm. And so if we accept that those things are true, that um, that we should start with the most accessible system and only add barriers where it is legitimately necessary, mm -hmm. then I think that requires us to really put ourselves to the test every time we're doing that, every time we're adding a step, adding a rule, adding a cost, adding a delay, we better have a darn good reason for doing that. And my main point is that when we take the opposite approach where we try to paper the world with every eventuality, try to account for every edge case, no matter how remote, add a rule for everything that could conceivably possibly happen, no matter how little factual underpinning we have to support that it has or could, mm -hmm. what, we, what we've done is violated that principle. So I guess what I'm saying is instead of papering the, the world with rules, which is what we are taught to do as lawyers, and papering the world with um, brainstorming every uh, remote catastrophic uh, potential outcome and then accounting for that, we should set all of that to one side. We should start from the perspective that if we are going to push somebody away from their justice system by adding delay, cost, complexity steps, we better have an empirical basis for it. And if it's a thing that could only hypothetically happen, but never has in our knowledge, uh, but maybe could, maybe one day, that is not a good enough justification for making 100% of people jump through a hoop. Uh, because the value of access to justice has to have content and the content has to be a, a principled one. So I'm not suggesting that we don't have any safeguards or any guardrails. I'm saying that to the extent we put in those guardrails, we have to accept that that's an administrative burden. And every time we add an administrative burden, 
we have we know that we are sacrificing accessibility and there has to be a good reason for doing that it can't be on the basis of some uh, remote possibility of an outlier case that's not good enough in my view mm -hmm. so there are too many shades of gray in the legal system and we need more black and white I just well I, I think we need more empiricism i think we need more mm -hmm. data i don't think it's acceptable for us to create new rules new procedures new forms new processes new swearings more affidavits more 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 on the basis of, of, of something that is hypothetical because the access to justice crisis is not hypothetical is very very real mm -hmm. um i recently wrote a paper and we all know that we know it's real we know it has real quantifiable harms for people and so uh, weighing these hypothetical risks that we're papering um, through rules and procedure and cost and complexity uh, is antithetical to, to recognizing the reality of people's everyday, um, everyday reality. And just one really quick example of that is, is a paper I recently wrote on fee waivers, the process by which people can have their court fees waived if they have a low income. That process in most jurisdictions in North America is built on no evidence and it's massively burdensome. Uh, in British Columbia, it requires people to figure out which forms to fill out. One of those forms has to be uh, notarized. We, have to, we require people to have all kinds of supporting documentation. They have to go down to the courthouse. They have to file their paperwork. They have to appear before a master in chambers. Uh, they have to satisfy the master that they are entitled uh, to the fee waiver. They have to enter the order. All of this over $200 in court fees. We have no evidence to support that this prevents fraud. We have a lot of evidence through the uh, advocates that I interviewed that this has a real harm for people who are looking to judicially review a, an eviction order. But in order to do that, they can't pay the $200 court fee and they have to go through these disproportionate mechanisms to do that. The harm is real. The evidence of fraud is non-existent. And you do have a comparator because as you point out, um, the CRT does things differently. So for fee waivers, we don't ask for supporting documents. Literally people can click three buttons, hit submit, uh, and they get their fee waiver immediately. Only 3% of 20,000 cases have gone by way of fee waiver. There's no evidence of, of abuse, even if you make it dead simple for people. And so uh, again, I think that supports the idea that we should assume that people are for the most part honest that they want to do the right thing, that they respect institutions. And we should also assume that, um, that any time we create an additional step, we are alienating people from the justice system. And we should only do that where there's good supporting evidence to justify it. Well, I think this is a good summary of uh, our interview today. We need to have good supporting evidence to justify complicated rules of procedure that create uh, an access to justice crisis. One last question. Do you think the CRT model will be extended to superior courts or uh, the caps will be increased? And if, if not, what's standing between this um, on, on the way of doing that? I, I can't comment on any future plans that the ministry or the government here might have. Uh, th those are policy decisions. But I will say that the whole model of human-centered design, online dispute resolution, is being increasingly adopted by courts around the world. There's exciting uh, examples in Utah, in the United Kingdom, in Australia, uh, all kinds of countries in Europe, uh, states in the US, where courts themselves are taking on the challenge to do human-centered design uh, to do user testing, to, to think critically about their processes and to uh, evolve them. That won't always look like the CRT and, and nor should it. Um, the CRT is an outcome of human-centered design. It is not a one-size-fits-all solution, but I think there's no area of our justice system, whether it's in the civil side or, or family or, or criminal, that wouldn't benefit from a critical re-examination of why we do the things we do and a real attempt and curiosity to see that process through the eyes of the people who have to navigate it. Well, Shannon, I'm really thankful to you for this interview. I hope as many people as possible uh, here in Ontario watch it. And I want to wish you all the best and CRT all the best in what they do. Uh, it really blows my mind uh, as a litigator what you uh, accomplished and what you're doing. And uh, I really hope to hear more good and interesting news from CRT in the future. Thank you so much, Shannon.
Thank you, Pilat, and thank you for the really interesting uh, discussion. And really, the credit goes to our team here in, in BC. But uh, I really appreciate the discussion. It was really engaging.